Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to another exciting Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants program. My name is Jesse, and welcome back to our old-time favorite teachers and some new folks today joining us as well. If you are joining us for the first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. Now, counterintuitively, back in February, we did this amazing program series, a seven-series, seven-program epic with the amazing team at March Mammal Madness. So if you want to check that out, all those programs are on our YouTube channel. We have a separate sub-site for them. They were absolutely amazing. And if you want to check them out on social media, it's hashtag 2022MMM as well. So today we are bringing back our second speaker from that program for an individual program as I just couldn't get enough of them. And that is Dr. Christy Luton. So Christy is joining us today in lovely USC at the Keck School of Medicine, where she's going to tell us today a little bit about ancient human discovery. Specifically, we think about humans. We walk by Peterly, we walk around. It's very fun. How did that happen? How do we end up in a situation where all the other apes are quadrupedal, we're bipedal? What's going on? Her work sort of details form and function, skeletons changing over time, all sorts of really neat stuff, and I'm so excited for you to meet her today. So, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Christy. Thank you so much for joining us, and take us Hello. away. Hello. Hello. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here today. So let me go ahead and share my screen. I absolutely love your backdrop, by the way. While you're sharing your screen, we've got this fantastic skeleton picture, very Mexican looking. It's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. All right. That looks good. You're good to go. <laughs> Great. Okay, so hello everyone. Thank you for being here today. I'm super happy to talk to you about skeletons and movement and how primates move and how did it get to be that we walk on two legs. So first I want to actually introduce myself a little bit. Who am I? How did I get to be a biological anthropologist? Um, like many kids, I loved fossils and bones when I was a kid, and I still love fossils and bones. So when I was really young, about six years old, I would volunteer at a local natural history museum cleaning fossils, little teeny tiny fossil shells. And you might not know this, but when people prepare fossils, they use all kinds of different tools. But one of the tools that we were using was this, a dental pick. So the same thing that your dentist uses to like scrape plaque off of your teeth, we use that to clean the sediments away from these teeny tiny fossil shells. So I loved that. It was super fun. And then a couple of years later, I had the opportunity to participate in a dinosaur dig in Montana. So this is a photo of me um, excavating some dinosaur bones out of a quarry. So it's kind of, they're eroding out of the dirt here. And each one of these um, dark gray blobs is um, fossil dinosaur bones. And these belong to a species of dinosaur called Myasaura, which was a hadrosaurid, so a big dinosaur that ate plants and herbivore. And you can see in this image that um, this was a big dinosaur compared to the size of a human. So as I got a little bit older, started getting into high school, I became less interested in dinosaurs and more interested in humans and human evolution and really interested in human fossils. So I went to college, I uh, majored in anthropology, and then I decided to go to graduate school. I wanted to get a PhD, I wanted to become a professor. Um, and so I went to grad school at Arizona State University and I had the good fortune to be able to participate in field work there. So this is an image when, uh, from when we were looking for fossils in Ethiopia. This is in a region called the Afar region of Ethiopia, which this little yellow dot up here in the Horn of Africa, that's where we were. Um, you can see in this image that there's not a lot of plants, not a lot of trees. It's fairly open landscape. There are some rolling hills. And so you go out in teams and you're just walking around looking at the ground. So the fossils are just eroding out of the ground and they're on the surface. So that was sort of a typical fossil survey. And then um, several years later, I looked for new fossil hominin or human ancestor sites in South Africa. So way down here at the tip of Africa. And the fossil sites in South Africa are totally different from those in East Africa. So most of the fossil sites in South Africa are actually underground in caves. So the fossils are not just eroding out onto the surface of the ground. They're actually underground. So we were looking for new cave sites. And this is a photo of me taking a photo of um, the entrance to an underground cave. 
So I love field work. I love looking for fossils, but it's actually not what I spend most of my time doing. What I spend most of my time doing is measuring and studying bones of living animals so that we can understand the bones of animals in the past. So this involves going to museums. So milk museums have collections of bones behind the scenes. Um, so go to museums and measure bones. I make 3D models of bones. And then I bring those 3D models back to my lab at USC where I'm able to analyze and process those images. So it's really handy to be able to make a 3D model of a bone because it means you can keep studying it even when you're not at the museum. So I've been able to visit museums across the globe, um, many museums in the United States, um, some in England and Scotland and France and South Africa and Madagascar. And I wanted to show you kind of what it's like, a, a day in the life of working in the collections at a museum. So this is an image from um, a visit to a museum in England a couple of years ago where I was studying gorilla bones and chimpanzee bones. So this is my little table set up and I was um, in the middle of the table, I was studying a, a gorilla hip bone and I was making 3D models of them. And that little blue thing is a 3D scanner. It's kind of the size of like a clothes iron and it's handheld, you pick it up and you just wave it over whatever you want to make a 3D model of. So in this case, Gorilla Hip Bone. And the, it makes a 3D model within the laptop. So in the laptop image on the left, you can see it's beginning to make a 3D model there. Um, other important things when you're doing science, you'll notice on the left side, I have a notebook. Always important to take notes and keep a record of what you're doing. Um, on the right side, next to the iPad, there's a little device called calipers, which is basically a very fancy ruler. <laughs> it measures the lengths of bones um, very accurately and very precisely. And then of course I have the iPad as well. That's helpful for keeping an inventory where I enter every single bone that I'm working on, that I'm measuring, and just keeping track of um, the data that I'm collecting. So this hip bone here, I want to show you what it actually looks like once we make that into a 3D model. So here is that exact same bone, but now this is the 3D model that I made. So in the computer, we're able to spin it around and look at various aspects of it. Um, and it contains all of the size, correct size information for that bone. So if I was going to measure the width of some aspect of the bone on this model, it would be the real actual width of that bone. So I make all these 3D models and then measure various things on them. Well, now, why do I <laughs> measure all these bones? And the reason is because I'm really interested in the ways that primates move. Primates move in all different ways, and I'm interested in how the muscles and the bones allow that to happen. So I want to talk a little bit about the different ways they, that, that primates move. So I've listed just a couple of types of locomotion here. On the upper left is a capuchin monkey. It moves on all fours in the trees. So it walks on its arms and its legs, usually on the tops of tree branches. Um, it can come down to the ground, and it does sometimes, but it really spends most of its time moving in the trees. And we can contrast that with um, the monkey on the lower left, which is a gelata monkey, which lives in Ethiopia. And it does also move on all four limbs, but it moves pretty much exclusively on the ground. So it lives on the ground. It actually eats grass. So it really actually spends most of its time sitting all day long, uh, eating grass seeds. They have actually really short little fingers that allow them to have uh, dexterous grasping so they can pick up teeny tiny grass seeds and eat them. Geladas are basically like the cows of the primates. <laughs> um, in the middle of the top, we have an orangutan, which you've probably seen at the zoo. Um, orangutans hang or suspend themselves and they move by climbing and suspensory locomotion. And this particular orangutan you can see she's suspending herself by both of her arms and also one of her legs. And then she has offspring kind of sitting on her shoulders slash on her head. Um, and that offspring is also hanging or suspending itself from one of its arms. 
And then the last two forms I'm going to talk about are leaping locomotion, which is very cool. So it's basically jumping. It's a fancy word for jumping. And there are lots of primates who jump from tree to tree to tree. And this is where they're using just their legs, just their hind limbs to push off from a tree and then land on one. And then last, of course, I have to mention humans because we're interested in the origins of walking on two legs. So humans walk on two legs. That's called bipedalism. Bi means two and ped means foot. So walking on two feet. And this is something that we do all day, every day. This is just a normal part of our lives. But if you put humans within the broader context of primates, under the broader umbrella and think about all of our primate cousins, we're actually extremely weird. We're the only living primate that walks on two legs and it's a very strange form of moving around. So I'm really interested in how the skeletons of these animals allow them to move in whatever ways they move. So I wanted to show some examples of what different primate skeletons look like. So for um, a primate that moves on all fours in the trees, so quadrupedal, but in the trees, like the squirrel monkey on the top left, they tend to have arms and legs where the bones are about the same length. So arms and legs about the same length, and they tend to have a really long tail. We can see that in this, um, in this image here, long tail bones. That long tail is really important when you're in the trees it helps an animal balance. So you're on top of a tree branch, you don't wanna fall because if you do fall, you have a risk of hurting yourself. And that tail helps them balance on top of these tree branches. Um, monkeys that move on all fours, but on the ground have some similarities and some differences um, to monkeys that move on all fours in the trees. So on the top right is a baboon. Um, baboons go in the trees and on the ground, but they travel on the ground. When they're trying to get from point A to point B, they do that on the ground. And again, in the skeleton, you can see that the legs and the arms are about the same length, more or less. That kind of makes sense because if you think of your kitchen table, it has four legs. All those legs are the same length so that the table surface is nice and flat and even. Same thing with these quadrupedal monkeys. Um, you also notice that the baboon has a shorter tail and that's because they don't spend as much time in the trees and so they don't need to have a super long tail to help them balance. On the lower left is a tiny little primate called a tarsier um, and these are leaping primates and when they move they leap from one tree branch to another and then when they're just sitting or resting they're always in this little crouched position they kind of curl up into a ball um, and if we look at its skeleton, you see that its hind limbs, its legs are really long compared to the arms. So much longer legs than arms. They also have a super long tail. That long tail is really important for helping that animal maneuver its body through the air as it's leaping through the air. And you'll also notice that they have really big eye sockets. Um, these are nocturnal primates, so they come out at nighttime. They have to have big eyes to let in a lot of light. And then on the lower right, there's a chimpanzee, which you've probably seen in a zoo before. Chimpanzees, when they're on the ground, they move quadrupedally on all fours, but they spend a lot of time in the trees as well, hanging, climbing, suspending. And primates that spend a lot of time hanging and suspending tend to have long arms. And we can see that in the skeleton here, where the chimpanzee skeleton has super long arms. So um, we can look at different aspects of the skeleton. We can look at the tail, we can look at the fingers, we can look at the arms and the legs and really start to notice some differences and similarities across and between primates that move differently. And so it's really important if you wanna understand something about fossil species, it's really important to study the skeletons of living species. Starting with living species, that lets you understand the links between the anatomy of the animal and its behavior. So for example, it's locomotor behavior or how it moves. And then once we understand those links, we can apply them to the fossil record. So I wanna focus on leaping for a second because it's just an extremely cool way of moving around. Um, so, there are primates called bush babies. 
also called galagos. You can call them either one. And the image on the left is a bush baby mid leap. So it's in the air, its legs are all stretched out. It's just pushed off from that tree. And I wanna show you a video of what these um, little primates look like. So they're nocturnal. They live inside cavities within trees. So they spend the day kind of sleeping in there. They come out at night to look for insects, which is their favorite food. And look at that leap. They're able to um, perform these just absolutely fantastic leaps. They're able to leap a really long distance. They have long legs and a long tail. So check out those legs, super long. They push off with the feet, they land with the feet and the arms basically don't do much of anything. So leapers, whether they're primates or rodents or marsupials, because there are other mammals that leap, they all have long legs. And this is really important but it, because it increases the leap distance. Longer the legs, the further you can leap. So if we go back to our tarsier skeleton, we can look again at those legs and just really appreciate how very long they were and how that helps them leap. Um, and all the different parts of the leg, so the thigh, the shin bones, the ankle, the foot, all of the parts are long compared to other primates that don't leap. So if we just kind of zoom in and look at the foot for a second, this is a comparison of different primate feet. We have the skeleton on the top and then the actual um, skin and everything on the bottom. And all these feet look kind of similar. I mean, they have a similar layout where you have these long toes, everybody has toes. And then in the ankle, there's these little square kind of blocky bones, ankle bones. And in most primates, they're just little tiny cubes basically. But in some of these small leapers, those bones have gotten really long and they look totally different than other primates. And if we just zoom in here on an X-ray of a foot of a bush baby, we can see those long ankle bones. So all the bones in your body have their own names. These particular bones are the navicular and calcaneus. Um, and they're super long in leaping primates just to help them um, increase the overall length of their limb. So one of the things that I do, I mentioned, I make 3D models of bones and then study the anatomy. Um, for this project, we're looking at uh, leapers and we're actually using um, CT scanning, so X-ray scanning to make models of bones. We can measure various things on the outside, but the really nice thing about using X-rays is that we can look at the inside of bones. So if we look at the inside of this calcaneus um, and then just say, take a slice through it. So the blue area is just a slice through the bone. All of the blue part that solid bone within their, this little ankle bone. So we can measure things like how much bone is in there? Is it a lot of bone or a little bit of bone? How strong is the bone? Um, and we're starting to look at this, not just in the ankle bones, but also in the leg bones and the thigh bones as well of lots of different primate leapers. And when you take a big view looking at primates and even at other non-primate leapers, what we start to see is that the hind limb bones are stronger in leapers compared to quadrupeds. And this has to do with all of the enormous forces that are generated when these animals leap. So leaping is cool and I could talk about it for a long time, but we're all interested in humans and why we are the way we are and how did it get to be that we walk on two legs. So humans are bipedal, we walk and run on two legs and um, I could talk for hours about the human skeleton and how we're adapted to walking on two legs, but we don't have hours. So I only do it for a few minutes. Um, so first of all, how many bones do you think there are in the human skeleton? 50 Ooh. bones? 100 bones? 3,000? A million bones? A million bones. A million bones. <laughs> not, no, not, we'll, we'll, we'll veto that option, but if people want to chime in on the chat, StreamYard or YouTube, we can see. I think some of our groups might actually know this outright. I think I learned it about the age that some of our kids are in there. You got a lot of great fours and fives. Anyone wants to chime in? How about Avica West? Do you guys have a thought? How many bones do people have? Do you know? One hand. Hearing hundred six. Hundred six. Hundred six. Two hundred and twenty six. Hundred and twenty six. Hundred and twenty six. 
206, Christy. That's very specific. I don't know. 206. Very good. That is correct. Very good. In, in these images, it kind of looks like there's more than 200 bones, but yeah, there's only 206 bones in our skeleton. And anthropologists study all of these different bones. So people will specialize. They'll be like, you know, some tiny little uh, wrist bone specialist, um, or one person might study the femur. Um, I like all of the hind limb bones. So anything related to the legs, that's what I study. Um, you don't have to be an anthropologist or a specialist to be able to see that there are differences between human skeletons and ape skeletons. So in this image, we have a human on the left and an ape on the right. And we can look at things like arm length. Well, the arm is a lot longer in the ape compared to the human. We can look at leg length. Um, the leg is a lot longer in the human compared to the ape. We can look at things like the shape and the anatomy of the feet and see that they are really different feet. Or we can look at the shape and anatomy of the torso. So the part of the rib cage that houses your lungs and your heart, those um, parts of anatomy are really different between these species. And all of these differences are related to the different ways that these animals move around. I have spent a long time studying and thinking about the hip bones. So I'm gonna just zoom in on the hip bones here. And they do look really different compared, uh, a human compared to an ape. So let's kind of go into a little bit more detail here. This um, is an image of two models, which I'll spin around in a minute. On the left is a chimpanzee, and on the right is a human. And these are two 3D models that I made. So if we spin them around here, we can look at the back side of the bones. There's lots of similarities, like they're obviously the same bones, but there are a lot of differences between them. Um, and as we look at the front side here, we can start to see some of those differences. And then we'll end on a side view. So in the side view, you can see this socket area. Um, that's your hip joint. And that's actually a part that's really different between chimps and humans. So this top part of the hip bones is called the ilium. And when you put your hands on your hips, that's what you're feeling, your ilium. And there's a big difference between chimpanzees and humans in the shape and orientation of this bone. So in chimps, it's long and it's thin and it's oriented on the back side of the body. Whereas in humans, it's short, it's curved, and it's on the sides of our body. And having those bones oriented on the sides repositions the muscles of our hips that allow us to walk on two legs. And it allows us to walk um, more uh, efficiently. We can also look at this section between the hip joint and your lower back. And the section of the ilium is pretty slender and small in the chimpanzee, but this region is really large and robust in humans. And that's because when we're walking um, and running on two legs, all of our body weight is transmitted through this region of bone because of course we're not using our arms to, to walk. So all of the body weight is going through this part of the pelvis. And this part of the pelvis needs to be a lot more robust to be able to withstand all of that body weight. We can also look at things like the ischium. That's the part of the bone that you're sitting on right now. Um, in chimpanzees, it's long. In humans, it's short, and it kind of projects out uh, posteriorly backwards. Um, and that helps us uh, extend or um, bring our leg behind us while we're walking. So these are all different features of bipedalism. There are lots of other adaptations to bipedalism in the pelvis and in other parts of the skeleton. But again, I don't, don't need to go into all of them, but there are lots of different features of bipedalism. And so you might be wondering, when did bipedalism first occur? So I'm gonna show a chart here. And on the scale is in millions of years, where zero is at the top, that's where we are, that's present day. And then we have underneath that one million years ago, two million years ago, three, four, five, etc. And there were two lineages, one that led to humans and one that led to chimpanzees. And those lineages split about six million years ago. And when that split occurred is when we have the origin of bipedalism in the human lineage. 
So bipedalism is old. There have been species that have been doing this for probably 6 million years. And if we put all those species onto the plot, these are all hominin species. So a hominin is a species that's more closely related to humans than to chimpanzees. And the oldest pelvis that we've found in the fossil record is of a species called Artipithecus ramidus. Uh, it's about four and a half million years old. Um, and this species lived in East Africa. And people have measured all different parts of its pelvis and have shown that it definitely did walk on two legs, but it was kind of intermediate. It, it also showed some features that were kind of more like apes. Um, we have found lots of different um, pelvis and leg bones of many of these species, and people have studied all of them and determined that all of the species in the human lineage were bipeds, so they all walked on two legs. They might have also spent some time in the trees, but all species in the hominin, hominin lineage were bipeds. So if we look again at the hip bones, um, we can see that human ancestors have hip bones that are more like humans. So in this image, there is a human on the right and a chimpanzee on the left. And then in the middle, we have a fossil species called Australopithecus afarensis. This particular skeleton is called Lucy, is its nickname. Um, and you may, might have seen this in a museum. And this species lived about 3 million years ago in East Africa. And all of the um, brown dark parts of the skeleton are the fossils that we've actually found for this individual. And then all the white parts are the parts that weren't recovered. So those are missing parts. And if we just draw our attention to the hip bones again, we can see that that Lucy pelvis really looks a lot more like humans than chips. So the ilium is short, it's wide, it's oriented on the side of the body, not on the back of the body. And it has various features that show that it definitely walked on two legs. So um, it's really important if you want to be able to say something or figure out how fossil humans and other fossil primates moved, it's really important to study the skeletons of living primates. That helps us make those connections between what the anatomy is and what the behavior is. And once we understand those connections, we can then apply them to the fossil record and reconstruct the lives of fossil species. So that's it for my slides. I wanted to thank you all for coming. And also I want to thank the funders of my research. Thank you so much, Christy. Well, if you want to come out of screen share, I'll give you a second to do that. We can have a bit of a conversation. A uh, great group is on YouTube. If you guys want to share questions in the chat bar, please do our Avoca West friends live with us. I'm excited for your queries as well. But I'm going to kick off with one that we almost always get when we talk about human evolution in any way. And that is, are we still evolving? Like, could we end up like those lemurs able to leap 40 feet? Could we end up like a gibbon where we could swing from trees? Or is that like out of the question for us in the short or long term? I don't know. Well, that would be extremely cool. Um, but yes, the answer is we're still evolving. Um, all species are still evolving. It's just the time scale is so, so, so um, small that it's hard to observe it. Um, but there are, uh, for example, the microbiome, there are organisms that live in your gut that uh, are evolving with us. Now, are we going to become leapers? Probably not, although can you imagine how cool that would be? But yeah, we're definitely still evolving. I must say, I don't know what's better, like the lemur thing, the 40 feet, or I, I, I must hit the given, like the brachiation where you grab something, you can swing your whole body and go a different direction, 40 feet is just wild. It'd so be fun. Glad we, it would be fun. It's like closest in our lineage that we've ever come to flying, really. Um, so <laughs> it, it's very, very cool. Um, Mr. Tills Glass, joining us on YouTube, wants to know, so joining us in St. Paul, Minnesota, talk more about Lucy. So Lucy is the one thing that really has permeated public consciousness about fossils and human evolution. So what species a little bit more, anything you could share about our, our, our past ancestors? Yeah. So Lucy is um, one individual of a species. So the species is Australopithecus afarensis. This species lived about 3 million years ago um, in East Africa. Um, the species definitely walked on two legs, but probably spent some time in the trees as well. So people have studied the arms, the shoulder bones, and have definitely determined that there are some features that suggest that um, there was some amount of climbing or suspension. 
But back three million years ago, the climate was different than it is today. So it was a little bit cooler, a little bit drier, and the trees were spaced out where Lucy's species live. And so in order to get from one tree to the next, assuming that there were food sources in those trees, um, these individuals of the species walked on two legs to get there. So there might have been some time in trees, climbing, hanging, hanging out, and then moving from one tree to another would have been walking on two legs. Very, very cool. Thank you for that. Um, let's head to Africa West with Michael's group. If you guys have a question for us, come on in. Hey, guys. We have, hi, we have quite a few questions here, so we're, we're pretty excited. Mila, uh, no, no, you want to come up and ask the first question? Mila. Um, uh, why do you love making 3D prints? Great question. Um, the thing about it is that it's really um, handy and it makes it a lot easier to do science. So if you want to study bones, fossils, etc., all of those bones and fossils are stored in a museum. Um, and some people live next to museums and so they might be able to go to the museum every day to study them, but other people don't. And so if you're able to make 3D models and 3D prints of bones, you're able then to take those back to wherever you study and work and continue studying those bones. So it kind of opens it up so that um, it's a little bit more accessible. And there are websites online where people have posted 3D models of bones. So for example, morphosource.org is a great resource. Um, it's a repository where researchers post models of bones that are then open for other people to study. Um, there are tons of, of different bones on there, um, not just primates, all different species are on there. Very cool. All right. I, I hope I got that spelling right as you were saying. That's that right. Really Perfect. Um, we're going to take a couple more from YouTube and we'll come back to you guys with Michael's group. So our next question, is there is there anything that's difficult for us because we're bipedal? So everything else in our lineage is either like gripping a tree or walking around. Is there something as we've sort of shifted to this upright stance that, you know, maybe we get cricks in the neck whereas other apes don't? Or how does, is there anything like that that jumps to mind? Hmm. Yeah. So there definitely are some drawbacks to being bipedal. Um, so first of all, advantages of being bipedal. Being bipedal is actually, it's a very efficient way of moving. So we can walk for a really long time without getting very fatigued and that's great. Um, but there are, are some drawbacks. So um, we do see back pain is an issue that a lot of people have, um, especially in the lower back that is related to being upright. Um, we also see some issues related to knee problems, so knee pain. Um, now, these are probably not just only because we're bipedal. There probably are some other issues involved there as well in terms of um, people having jobs where maybe they have to sit at a computer all day long and that puts some stresses on your knees and your hips, on your back. I know I sit at a computer all day long. <laughs> Oh, uh, dear. Okay. Oh, what is behind? See, we hadn't noticed this. Behind you, you shifted. Is there like a giant orangutan thing behind your shoulder? What is that thing? Um, oh, it's a picture. Okay. <laughs> there no? is a picture, but I do also have a skull. My that favorite very cool. fossil skull. Okay. What is it? This is from a species called Paranthropus ethiopicus. Ooh. And it has a nickname, which is the black skull, because it was found somewhere where there was a lot of manganese in the soil. So the bones actually look black. Um, but it had this like huge face, this big sagittal crest at the top of the skull for the chewing muscles to attach to. They had humongous teeth and it was just a cool fossil. So I'd like to look at it. It's very it's cool. Neat. It's like a built-in mohawk. And so for chewing things like what, like nuts or bones or like what would you need that big muscles for? Basically plants. Okay. So seeds, grasses, sedges, different types of plant matter that takes just a long time to process. Um, so I mentioned that gelatas are kind of like the monkey, uh, sorry, the cow of the monkeys. These um, paranthropus species, these robust australopithecines, they were kind of like the cows of the hominins. They just spent a long time processing and chewing plant matter. Okay. And they had to have huge muscles and huge teeth to do it. I mean, very large teeth. I have a pudding and coffee-based diet, so I really don't need any of those things at all. My job is <laughs> just pour right off and I'd be good. Uh, no, well, actually, that brings up a really interesting point, which is 
through time, human jaws have been getting smaller and smaller and smaller because past, let's say, mm, 10,000 years after the advent of agriculture and processed foods, especially um, in the past couple hundred years, uh, we don't chew a lot. A lot of the foods that we eat are processed. And so people's teeth are becoming smaller. The mandible, the jaw is becoming smaller. Um, a lot of people now don't have a third molar, the wisdom tooth. So um, we are seeing this change through time related to diets of like skulls getting smaller. Yeah, very, very cool. Okay, there's that evolution in action we were talking about at the beginning. Uh, let's head back to Ms. Michael's group and then we'll take a couple from YouTube. Uh, come on in, Avika West. Hey. All right, we've got, we've got Bosani here. And by the way, I wanted to tell you that this is our lunchtime group people, all the fourth grade classes came in and gave their recess. They're really interested. So I heard you said like the gel gelaja monkeys. Are those like, are the, are those the monkeys that have like that red patch in the middle of their chest? Yeah, that's right. Those are the monkeys with the red patch on the chest. Um, and they have really long hair as well. Um, and they have huge canines, um, which they use to display at each other and to uh, have fights and things. But they definitely don't use those big canines for eating. It's really just for social display. That was a really short question. So if you guys have another one, feel free to go for it. Hassan's got another one. That was just an extra one she thought of. Uh, like, were those bones that you said you found in the Afar region, do you find them in any other regions? or just that place? Yeah, so a lot of the fossils that we found in the Afar region are found all throughout East Africa. So the kinds of species that are found there are the Lucy species, which is found in other places in East Africa as well, and many other different types of Australopithecus. Um, they've also found fossil humans, so genus Homo, so we're Homo sapiens. Um, there are fossil genus Homo from that region as well. So. Ethiopia, Kenyan, uh, Kenya, Tanzania, all of those countries have a lot of these sort of similar types of fossil hominins. Okay, our next question. I love this one. Mr. Chill's class is going for it with this one. Could we grow wings? That'd be very cool. We were talking about swinging earlier. That's awesome. Is there is there wings in our future or are we done? No way. Unfortunately, I don't think there are wings in our future, but it would be extremely cool. Um, <laughs> I mean, maybe in many, many, many millions of years, but probably not, unfortunately. So, you know, one of the things worth noting for all our classes about evolution and change over time is it's not just like, ideally, we'd have wings and maybe we'd have wheels. We could go on roads so much faster than we would need cars. But every step along the process has to be make you more fit and better, basically, better able to survive in your environment than the thing before. So you wouldn't wake up with wings. You'd have little nubs on your back. And how would the nubs in your back help you survive any better? That's the question you have to ask. Or maybe you have something that looks like a shield. How would that help you better? To get to wings, it's a long process. And so you see the evolution of things like birds and bats, where slowly but surely they did have these slight modifications that did help them better. Help them glide maybe between a branch to another branch. Help them, you know, take in more energy from the sun if they opened up their arms with the longer feathers. And so you have things like that that are, are beneficial. And then, oh, you can fly, uh, which is really cool. It's a very dumbed down version of it, I suppose, but I, I think it's important to note for our kids. So a uh, very cool thought. I wish we could, but I think we all wish we could. Christy and I are like super in the same boat about all the cool things we could evolve, but not yeah. quite. So another great question we got online was, do different groups of people have consistently different fossil elements? Like, is there a difference between people in Europe or Australian origin or anything else that we can see in their skeletons? Or is it just the person in the not really. anatomy? Yeah. Not really. Um, it is very difficult to identify any kinds of differences among population populations in the bone specifically. Um, a lot of those differences that we see are superficial differences um, from the outside, but in the skeleton, no, not really. Right. We're all the same. 
Right. So the big difference you'll see in different populations around the world is sort of height. So some cultures that get way more nutrition will end up taller people. That's why we have Scandinavians who are like six foot one on average and dwarf the rest of us. But that's not a, a built in nature of them. That's a reflection of. The yeah. And the and the shapes of the bones overall there do look similar. So yeah. in the case of, let's say, Scandinavians, if we look at the leg bones, yeah, on average, the leg, leg bones are probably longer, but. Um, it would be hard to say, oh, this person was Scandinavian because they have a really long femur. It could just be any person with a really long femur. Interesting. Perfect. Um, all right, Christy, time flies and you're having fun. I told you this program would fly by, so we're going to have one more time to our Illinois crew. Uh, wrap us up with one more question. Hey, guys. Um, how do you know how old a fossil is? Ooh, great question. So there's lots of different ways to date fossils. Um, there are ways where you can just look and see what are the other animals that lived, um, the other fossils that you're finding at that time period. And you might know like, oh, okay, these animals lived from this time to this time. And that helps you um, narrow down the time range when a fossil might have lived. Um, but the fossils are um, laid down in a, in a bunch of layers in the dirt, right? So there's like a stratigraphy, a layered um, uh, surfaces of the dirt, and you can date parts of the actual sediments themselves. So there's different ways, chemical ways of dating using carbon, for example, or uranium or other elements to figure out um, how old fossils were that were found in that sediment. I love this question. It's the second time we got it in like four days and it's so wild we almost never get it. So radiometric, a lot of our classes will be familiar with carbon dating, which we use for a lot of things like human artifacts, things that are archeological tools. We find an arrowhead, how do we date that? If you're dating a dinosaur bone, carbon dating specifically doesn't work, but it all falls under this banner of radiometric dating, how atoms slowly change over time. It's almost black magic, frankly. It's like the coolest thing ever. There was no reason that science, like that needed to be a thing, but it's so cool that we can go back through the eons and understand the age of things through this amazing scientific tool. So honestly, our class today, you're a few years away from learning this in a more detailed way, but it's one of the coolest things ever in science ever. It's so neat. Um, Christy, uh, this has been so much fun. Before we wrap up today, I know we've got groups again joining us from all over Canada and the US on YouTube and beyond. Is there a last message sort of universally for our class today that you want to leave us with before we wrap up? I would say if you're interested in bones, um, fossils, skeletons, anything like that, and if you want to get involved, definitely look into your local museums. Natural history museums often have um, opportunities for youths to volunteer or to just have some educational opportunities. And if this is something you're interested in, I definitely look in, uh, recommend looking into it. That was how I got started in this. I love that this is a piece of advice, pretty much no matter what the specialty is that comes up again and again, like talk to scientists, get involved, go explore. Yeah. I grew up in Toronto, so we have the Royal Ontario Museum down the street, and it was just an amazing experience to see that. Libraries too, so many great resources. Like you guys are growing up in a time where there's more information accessible to you than there's ever been in human history in your pocket. There's something that like, you know, the president and no one in the world knew what you have in your pocket now and you can find out anything ever discovered. So it's a very cool time. Go explore, go touch these fossils uh, if you get a chance. And uh, yeah, Christy, this has been so much fun. Thank you so much. I'm going to bring in our, our teacher crew live on YouTube. You guys can do a shout in your classrooms as well. But Avoca West joining me and saying a big thank you and farewell to Dr. Oh,